Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. This has been a process, of, a planning process of about nine months in the works, so we're excited to have you here and, um, and to get started. My name is Pat Renard. I'm uh, presently serving as the interim senior vice president here at St. Petersburg College for Students and Services. As chair of this year's Moving the Needle Conference, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth annual conference. We thank you for attending. There are many conferences to choose from, and we know that travel bu budgets for many of you are, are limited, and we're humbled that you've chosen this conference. We also want to thank you for your engagement in the process of student success. In the first years of this conference, we focus on how institutions could change their data culture to help make better informed decisions with the goal of increasing student success. This was and continues to be critically important work for if we are not looking at the same metrics across our institution and there's a lack of trust in that data, initiatives are doomed to fail. This year, however, we have decided to focus on student engagement and persistence from the framework of the four dimensions of the American Association of Community Colleges Academic Pathways Movement. The tagline, I'm sure as you've noticed, of this year's conference is the art of student engagement in today's data-driven culture. There is somewhat of a juxtaposition between the data science involved in changing our data culture and how we engage and how engaging students really is an art form. When we look at an individual student through the lens of our data, at the end of the day, we are still left with that one student sitting in front of us and no amount of data can replace that interaction and opportunity for engagement. There really is an art to meeting students where they are in life and engaging them so they feel connected, so they feel valued, and that they understand that what we can offer them can truly change their lives for the better forever. Being able to see college through the lens of a student is an imperative part of this art form. Because I would submit to you that the college experience that you and I experienced 10, 20, perhaps 30 years ago is vastly different uh, from the experience our students face today. So today it is my hope that you leave this conference with a renewed sense of inspiration, that you take with you one or two nuggets that will help you persevere in the critical and courageous work of student development, student success, and student achievement. At this time, I wanna uh, pay a special thank you to all of our sponsors without whom we could not put on a conference like this. You will have the opportunity to hear from many of our sponsors throughout this conference. Uh, this year, our title sponsor is Smart Thinking. And uh, we have three gold level sponsors, uh, SWIM, Inside Track, and Microsoft. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> we also have six silver sponsors. We have Ed Financial Services, Academic Impressions, Advantage Design Group, CMD, Tutor.com and Desire to Learn. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Lastly, we have one bronze sponsor, uh, BayCare Behavioral Health, and uh, uh, sorry, two bronze sponsors, PCS, and we have uh, two strategic uh, sponsors in NISOD and CCRC. You'll see those in your program. At this time, I want to quickly recognize and thank our keynote presenters. We are very fortunate to have so many powerful keynotes uh, at this conference this year. In just a few minutes, you will hear from Dr. Michael Bastion, president of Rockland Community College, and he will kick off the conference, and if you've not heard him before, you are in for a treat. After lunch, uh, you will hear from Dr. Evelyn Waiwaioli. Dr. Waiwaioli is the executive director of the Center for Community College Student Engagement, and she will challenge us by asking us a fundamental question, are we really a student-ready college? Then tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, uh, Madeline Pumariega, who is the chancellor of the Florida College System, uh, she will be here and she will uh, share with us the challenges and the opportunities of being a, a leader during this Pathways movement. And then tomorrow afternoon, uh, again, we're in for a real treat. Dr. Sandy Shugart, president of Valencia College, 
in a pre presentation he's entitled Bringing It All Together, uh, is going to share ideas on how to engage the entire college in the student success agenda. I want to quickly uh, say thank you to the provost of this campus, Mark Strickland. I see Mark in the back. Mark, would you raise your hand? Mark, we, we thank you for the use of your campus, and thank you uh, very much for your team who uh, has made uh, this day possible. I know they've done a lot of work, so thank you. So by the numbers, um, we have about 250 attendees, one of the, the largest Moving the Needle conferences uh, we've held. This, again, is our fourth one. Um, we have 13 sponsors. We have uh, 17 of the 28 Florida College System schools are represented uh, here this morning. 74 attendees have the title of president, vice president, chancellor, vice chancellor, chief information officer, chief learning officer, or provost. And 58 attendees have the title of dean, academic chair, uh, or professor or uh, in the faculty ranks. By the way, this is the largest number of faculty, deans, and chairs that we've ever had in attendance at Moving the Needle, and we're thrilled to have so many classroom student engagers with us today. So what is in your portfolio? We've got the program. Uh, we have a keychain charger, a lanyard. Uh, we're uh, very uh, happy to have um, a CD in, the, in your portfolio. Uh, the CD is um, of three bands that you will hear at lunch. We have student-led bands, SPC, SPC student-led bands that are going to uh, provide uh, music during our lunch uh, and, and uh, breakfast. And that's on your CD. These are music majors or students in our uh, music industry and recording arts program. So um, we're excited about um, being able to provide that for you. So what's new this year? We're on a campus, so we are on the Seminole campus, as you know. This is uh, one of five full-service campuses and 11 learning sites that St. Petersburg College has throughout the uh, uh, Pinellas County. We invite you to explore the campus. Uh, we have recently remodeled the Student Services Center, which is uh, out the back doors just slightly to the right. And if you would like a tour of the Student Services Center, we're very proud of that. Uh, you can speak to me or Provost Strickland, and we'll make sure you can get, have a tour of that. We're also incorporating uh, more students into this year's Moving the Needle conference. Um, we, in addition to the bands, uh, you'll see after lunch today, uh, students beginning to introduce the keynote speakers. Okay, This is all about student success. We want to incorporate students. We will also have tomorrow afternoon a student voices panel moderated by one of our deans here at St. Petersburg College. We've got five outstanding students with very diverse backgrounds, and, and uh, we're excited to hear from, from them and get their perspective and share that with you. This year, we uh, will have book signings. Um, Dr. J Davis Jenkins uh, from the Community College Research Center and one of the co-authors of the book, Redesigning America's Community College, uh, will be available to sign books um, during the lunchtime period today. And then, uh, Depending on Dr. Schugert's schedule, um, he has written a book called The uh, Co uh, Leadership in the Crucible of Work, and he's agreed uh, to uh, be here and sign books um, if he can get from Orlando here in time. We do have a Remind Me text, so uh, if you're interested, you can um, text the at sign at, uh, CFMTN 2017 to that number 810 one zero, and you can get any kind of conference uh, schedule changes. I, we have one already, so uh, you can take advantage of that um, if there's a change in, in schedule, and we need to communicate that to you. And uh, also new this year is that you'll see that um, the presentations closely align with the four dimensions of the AACC Pathways movement. So questions that you may have, uh, if you wonder where a session is, um, campus maps are located in your program on pages 12 and 13. All meals, uh, we, we, I'm sorry, we do have um, hosts uh, that can escort you from one building, building to the other. You registered and had breakfast in the conference center. This is the digitorium in the in university, university partnership building. 
Um, how do I know what sec session is next? Sessions will be posted in the presentation slides in each breakout room and on the walls next uh, in, in each of the rooms. Any additional questions? We have information tables outside the digitorium and also the registration table in the conference center. So for you tweeters out there, um, we invite you to um, uh, tweet your experience. Uh, there you see the hashtag, hashtag MTM conference. We invite you to share your thoughts and, and your ideas about today's conference and tomorrow's conference as well. Um, I wanna also just, just a little bit more housekeeping say that all of the concurrent sessions will be held in um, this building as all the keynotes will be held in this room. There will be some concurrent sessions that are held in this room as well. So just look at your, your schedule um, in your program uh, or uh, on the, on the uh, signs outside the, the doors. The, the two, there are two classrooms uh, immediately when you exit here to the right where uh, concurrent sessions will be and two classrooms to the left. So that's how you know where you're, where you're at. All, all of the uh, sessions will be on the first floor of, of this building. So we do have Wi-Fi. Uh, the network is guest Wi-Fi. There is no password required. All you have to do is, is uh, accept the terms and conditions and you're good to go. Okay, so at this time, I want to invite a representative from Smart Thinking to the stage uh, who will introduce Dr. Tanja Williams, president of St. Petersburg College. Dr. Williams will provide her welcome, her remarks, and the introduction of our opening keynote speaker. Smart Thinking, our conference title sponsor, is a leader in providing high quality on-demand tutoring. Their commitment to student success is only matched by their passion for partnering with customers like St. Petersburg College to identify and analyze new ways to move the needle on student retention and persistence. St. Petersburg College and Smart Thinking have been partners since 2005, and I am pleased to introduce the Smart Thinking Southeastern Senior Implementation Manager, Lisa Yoder, who will introduce Dr. Tanja Williams, President of St. Petersburg College. Lisa. Thank you, Pat. Dr. Tanja Williams became St. Peterburg College's seventh president in May when the college's board of trustees voted unanimously in her favor following a nationwide search. She's an accomplished educator and motivating leader with more than 30 years experience in student affairs, budgeting and financial management, innovative learning, initiatives and partnership development. Dr. Williams strongly believes in collaborative engagement and encourages creativity and freedom of expression among colleagues and college partners. She believes students succeed when they are motivated, encouraged, and have access to an environment conducive to learning. A St. Petersburg native, Dr. Williams serves on numerous community boards. She is a graduate of Leadership Tampa Bay and Leadership St. Pete, and has been honored for her leadership skills and civic contributions by the St. Petersburg Chamber of Commerce, the Tampa Bay Business Journal, and the Tampa Bay Network of Executive Women. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present the president of St. Petersburg College, Dr. Tanja Williams. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm a walker, so I don't know why they put me right behind the podium. I do not stand still. I want to welcome you to St. Petersburg College, to the Seminole campus. I'm Tanja Williams, the president. Very proud to be here today, but moreover, proud that you're here today. So why do we have moving the needle, and what does it really mean? We know that in higher education, we're being held accountable for student success and making sure that students complete what they started. But how do we do that without looking at data? 
How do we do that without making sure that what we're doing is actually working? I know it has not happened at your college, but have you ever worked really diligently on an initiative or a project and you find out it don't work? <laughs> but, but because you don't want to admit it don't work, you keep doing it. And, and, and after a while, people become disgruntled, they become frustrated and feel like they're wasting their time. Have you ever used too many man hours to try to get things done when others who are very quiet know, if they just do this, we can get this done without people? Um, so, so you're hearing some of the St. Pete College story. Um, we're not a perfect institution, but we are perfectly imperfect to do things that are right for the right reasons. We actually work very hard to help students succeed, but some of the work doesn't materialize in success. So now we're really looking at what data should we look at to make sure students are successful. You ever look at the wrong data? I know it doesn't happen at your school, but it definitely happens here where we spend so much time bean counting and looking at certain things that we find it really didn't matter anyway. So you're here this, the, the next couple of days to talk about what data do we look at and how do we really utilize the resources that we have to help students succeed? What really matters? Not everything that we do matter. And so we're gonna talk about the art of using data and supporting students through success. Many of us have said, well, uh, Guided Pathways is a huge movement. I mean, is this, it's the next best thing. I mean, it, it is a thing. It is really not a thing. It's what we do and how we do it. Because we know that students have less time for mistakes, right? We can't have them in the wrong program. They can't take the wrong courses. They can't take them at the wrong time using the wrong platform. Some are online learners, some are face-to-face. -face. So we've got to get it right from the beginning because right now, financial aid doesn't forgive. They don't care how many attempts you've had. You've used up your money, you're broke. That's how it goes. And so students are depending on us to make sure we do it right, that we get it right. We have students who start in different places when they start. At SPC, well, in Florida, our students, if they graduated after 2009, I believe, or is it seven? Seven, they don't have to take the placement test. They don't have to do developmental education. They can jump right into college level courses and fail. And, and for many, that is what's happening. So the reason pathway is so important is that we need some sort of process to help us better engage our students at the front door, use predictive analytics to find out who has the highest potential for failure, and then put together a strong plan to help them succeed and take them through the institution, their program, and get them across the stage. All of that takes time, it takes strategy, it takes energy, it takes technology, it takes effort, it takes momentum, and all of us are saying, well, what is the student's role in this? I feel like I'm doing all the work. They're just coming in, and we're doing everything. Well, <clears throat> the student has a responsibility for their success, but guess what? How many of us have shared with them what their responsibility for su their success is? Because they're coming from systems where they haven't had to be totally responsible, right? Now they're in college and we have to help them be responsible. So we have our part, they have their part. So over the next couple of days, using the pathways model in the four areas of how we prepare and create a path, get the student on the path, keep them on the path, and get them graduated and, and onto either their next educational pursuit or into a job. That's what this conference is all about. It is about those momentum points and where they are. And and pushing them through the funnel to get them in. So there's some homework that you'll have to do when you leave. A lot of times we go to conferences, we learn good things and they sit on, on a shelf. And I know you don't do that, but I've done it a, plenty times. And so we're hoping that you're gonna take this back and what you learn, and you're gonna use this to really help improve the student experience on your campuses, student um, selection of the right programs, getting on the right track, helping them stay on track, and then the creative teaching that has to happen in the classroom. 
I just had one of the best meetings with uh, my faculty yesterday at the Clearwater campus, and we had a good conversation about how hard it is to teach now because the students are not coming in with the same skill set. They're not college ready. And one of the hardest things for us to do is give up on students being college ready. They're not going to be ready. We have to be ready for them. And so to be ready for them, we're going to have to learn things we haven't had to learn. We're going to have to do things we haven't had to do. And things will be perfectly different because they're coming different all the time. And so we have to be ready for them. To be ready for them, we have to know what? Who they are. How many of us have really studied the type of students you're serving, the communities they're coming from, the poverty levels of the communities where they live, and what they need? Most of us are starting food pantries, clothing and toiletry um, pantries, things that are outside of just the academic classroom because we know if they're hungry, they're not going to learn. And so our world is changing because their world is changing. So that's what the pathways, I won't say movement, I would say the work um, is like, and we have to be prepared for that. And so for this conference, we have um, really worked hard to bring some dynamic speakers from different areas of the world, not just physically, but also with the work that they do. So you could see from a um, statewide standpoint, from a campus-based standpoint, but also looking at student affairs and academic affairs. So we're going to have some fun. So our next speaker, I'm going to have to read this because I, I might mess up. So his name is Dr. Michael Bastian. He is one of my Aspen Fellows colleagues. And we have some Aspen Fellows in the room. So I want to welcome you all here and, and very glad that you're here this week. Dr. Bastian is the president at Rockland Community College, which is a SUNY, is that right? Um, system. Prior to his role there, he served as Vice President of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at LaGuardia Community College. For nearly 20 years, Dr. Bastian has served in various capacities in higher education, including college legal counsel, adjunct faculty member, and dean of students. His research expertise include community college student persistence, student success, and student affairs administration. Dr. Bastin is a visionary leader and leads national change on college completion by helping 10,000 low-income students tap into $20 million in public benefits so that they can afford to stay in school. At LaGuardia, Dr. Bastin managed the largest student services portfolio among CUNY's, is that right? Um, 24 college system. His division encompassed admissions, academic advising, career and transfer services, international student services, academic testing, early childhood, student life, um, registrar financial aid, athletics, re recreation and disabilities, um, as well as special city University of New York retention initiatives, including uh, accelerated services and studies in associate programs like ASAP, um, college discovery, the College Opportunity to Prepare for Employment, um, which is the COAP program. He holds an undergraduate degree from Iona College, a JD from Brooklyn Law School, and a PhD in Education from St. John Fisher College. He's also one of the um, AACC Pathway Coaches for Florida. So he's my coach um, uh, here at St. Pete College, and I am the coach of Texas. <laughs> Um, pathway. So we are kindred souls. I want to introduce to you, get ready for church, um, <laughs> Dr. Michael Bastian. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Anybody ready to move the needle? <laughs> Clap your hands for the great president of Great St. Pete College. Dr. Williams, I'm excited to be with you this morning, to see all of you from many of the states around the country here to learn, to share, to grow, to build. We're going to do some things in the next two days that when you get back to your campus, you're going to rock and roll. You're going to be able not only to be encouraged and inspired, but you're going to be able to 
think more strategically about how you move the needle. So I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about where I'm from. I'm uh, formerly at LaGuardia, but now I'm the president of Rockland Community College. And so I want to show you a little bit about my college. Rockland Community College, founded in 1959. A two-year college in the State University of New York. We are located in the Hudson Valley, 25 miles north of New York City. We offer 40 associate degrees and 10 one-year certificate programs. We service 7,000 full and part-time students with distinguished award-winning faculty. We are proud of our nationally acclaimed honors program. RCC sits on a beautiful 175-acre campus. We also have a center in Havistraw and an automotive technology center in Orangeburg, New York. We offer 10 competitive athletic teams and over 40 student clubs. We are rated number one in community colleges for adult students in New York. We have one of the highest transfer rates in the SUNY system. And once again, we are an Aspen Award winner, named one of the top 150 community colleges in the country. Rockland Community College, a quality education is waiting for you. Thanks for coming with me to New York for just a few moments. And I'm excited because at Rockland, we're able to really help the students as they make their way through a system and in a world that is ever changing. When you think about what's happening in our world today, you see so many challenges from floods and tsunamis, nuclear threats and tornadoes, earthquakes and territorial conflicts, both home and abroad. We have just come through a tremendously challenging summer and fall. You might recall all of the hurricanes and the tornadoes that have come up. You see the devastation uh, from uh, Hurricane Harvey and others. And, but then people came together and began to build bridges to each other, which I think is so important, particularly at a time when we have seen in our nation so many challenges and so many ideas of the worst of us and, and some of the violence that we've seen throughout our nature, nation. But the power of our colleges is that even you can go from the torches uh, in Charlottesville of hate to those that light the way. And it's college campuses that are a part of lighting that way, that are making that future possible and bright. Because as Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Ultimately, our role as educators is to change the world. It is to help our students see that they can make the world a better place. And so at all of our campuses, we have the opportunity to move our students forward. I want to introduce you to one of my recent alums. And I want you to hear her story. I'll give more context afterwards. But she's the same student that's on many of your campuses. Her name is Yahidis Moskowitz. I'm Yohidis Moskowitz, and I recently graduated from RCC with a degree in liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences honors. Rockland Community College was the best option for me to attend because college was not an option for me growing up. And the financial aid and resources at RCC for coming in and taking an entrance exam instead of having a high school diploma were the best options for me to be able to attend higher education at all. I have an interesting story, actually, because I've always dreamed of going for medicine since I was really young. But when I started here at RCC, I wasn't even dreaming that far. It seemed like an impossible idea. And so I started at the media program because I do have a passion for art and film. And so I was part of RCC TV and I was going for a media degree here at RCC. It wasn't until I joined the honors program and took some science classes like biology and chemistry and did really well and enjoyed those that I realized that perhaps I could go for my dream, which is medicine. RCC has been amazing for me, honestly. The first semester I came here, I was just attending evening classes and leaving. I didn't know 
or pursue any of any out, anything outside of class. Um, but then once I began to get involved in extracurriculars, I joined RCC TV as a volunteer. Um, eventually, I, I I started my own club here. I started Humans of RCC. I made friends. I a attended you know clubs and events on campus. I found mentors on campus, which were extremely helpful. All of them were amazing in, in, in encouraging me to pursue my dream, which is medicine. And um, as, I, as I became more involved on campus, I found more things that RCC had to offer me. And that was, that was great. RCC has amazing resources. When I was nominated for the Chancellor's Award for Student Excellence, the SUNY Chancellor's Award, I was ecstatic. I got to go up to Albany and meet leaders and excellent students from all other SUNY campuses and get a medal uh, from, from the SUNY Chancellor, which was amazing. My mentors at the Honors Program helped me compile a list of schools that I, would, I should apply to. They encouraged me to apply to REACH schools, which I hadn't even dreamed of applying to, like NYU and Johns Hopkins and, and other prestigious universities that I didn't even think that I could apply to. Uh, as the acceptance letters started rolling in, I was blown away every time I got accepted to NYU and George Washington University, Stony Brook University. I got into Johns Hopkins University, which was an incredible experience. And then at the beginning of the summer, I got my acceptance letter to Columbia University. And that was incredible because I'd always dreamed of going to school in New York City and Columbia University has a wonderful pre-med undergraduate program, as well as a medical center where I could shadow and begin interning and learning about the medical field. And that's where I'll be starting this fall. And I'm really, really excited and grateful to everyone at RCC for that. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yahidis' story is no different than many of the students that come to your campus. Interestingly enough, she said that she started out in the evening program. She did not have a high school diploma. It is because she came out of a community that frowned upon young ladies going to school for anything. She went to school hiding out. She snuck out of her community to go to school. And when she came to us, she could not speak a whole lot of English. She, English was her second language because her community did not prepare her for basic education, but we did. We offered her the opportunity to expand her horizons. No one told her that she could go into the medical field, but we did. And when she came and she got nourished and encouraged and inspired by what she found at the campus, when folks spoke to her and cared about her and gave her a light in the midst of her dark situation, she started this fall at Columbia University. No high school diploma, but hopes and dreams. Sometimes we only think of students in terms of how far they go, but we also have to see where they start. And we've got to engage them in a way that allows us to understand that there is something inside of that student that can help them reach a height they never imagined. There's a Yahidis in every campus. There's that person who may have snuck under the radar of your experience, came in at night, took a few classes, but gained the courage, confidence, and commitment because of the way that you nurture them and the way that you encourage them and the way that you create systems and structures to move them forward. There's a Yahidis waiting on your campus that may feel disconnected and disengaged. And, and but for you saying it doesn't matter how you started, we accept you and we are going to embrace you at your level of preparation. And we are going to build a system that 
produces for you opportunity. There's a hiatus in your campus waiting for you to say to that person, there's more inside of you. The fact is there are many people on our campuses that are still questioning whether they should even go to college. Families are asking the question, do you still need college? You know, look at the tuition that seems to overburden so many students. Think about the debt that students bear. Do you still need college? Even the business community is wondering if we are preparing students well. 96% of college academic officers said they're confident in their institution's ability to prepare students for the workforce. But only 11% of the business leaders agree that today's college graduates have the skills and competencies that their businesses need. There's a disconnect when we think that we are preparing students to be able to go out and not only be educated folks, but, but committed citizens who can do some stuff and our employers say, I don't think so. In fact, employers want to know that students have leadership ability and teamwork and written communications and, and that they, they have a strong work ethic. And some of these things don't always connect with what we're teaching them and what experiences we are grounding them in. And so as we think about the work that we do to engage our students and our college and how we're going to construct student success, if we do so without recognizing that the world is changing and we as institutions must change, we will continue to be diminished in the eyes of the nation in terms of what's in the best interest and what is the best investment for the students. Now there are five trends that are really going to shape the world of work. First, of course, globalization. Because our students and our, our folks are operating in a world where boundaries don't exist. And so if we are just focusing on brick and mortar campuses, we are going to not be su as successful as we could be. And so we can't shy away from the online environment and say that's not our thing. Because some students, that is their thing. And think about mobility. You can connect to work as long as you have access to the web and can get your job done. And so we can't think of the kinds of ways in which we prepare students for the world of work as place-based anymore. Think about the new behaviors. As we work with our students, our students are living a public life. And therefore, they want real-time feedback, collaboration, and sharing. Anybody ever seen Facebook? Snapchat. Snapchat is better than Facebook for our younger student citizens because they can say what they want to say and it goes away. <laughs> could you imagine? What if you had that cheesecake last night? What if it, it, it could just go away? <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Of course, technology, our big data and our collaboration platforms and the Internet of Things, robots and automation, uh, automation, all of these things will affect work. But if our faculty and staff are not taking many of these trends in, we won't prepare the students for the kind of experience they'll have when they leave us. And then, of course, there's a little group called the Millennials. And they will make up 50% of the workforce by 2020 and 75% by 2025. Although older, or older generations are retiring later, many are becoming freelancers and, uh, after they retire. So that is going to impact not only s simply the, the world of work, but the opportunity we have to reach out to the adult learner market who needs retooling and new skills. We've got to be open to that idea. And so we must act now. Let me focus us for a moment on automation as an example. By 2034, 47% of US employment has the potential of being automated. I want to say that again. By 2034, 47% of the United States employment has the potential to be automated. In China, it's going to be about 77%. So we need to understand that many of the jobs that we're currently preparing students for will not exist 
in 2034. In fact, current technology has the ability to automate at least 30% of the tasks associated with more than half of the jobs in the global economy. As many as 83% of jobs paying less than $20 an hour will be impacted by automation. And so you don't have to wait online. Rosie the Riveter will come and bring you your food. More than 11 million entry-level workers in the United States can be displaced by automation. So that means that when we think about the jobs being replaced by robots, 68% of the mail carrier jobs will be replaced. 79% if you're in logging. 94% if you're a drill press operator. 68% if you're a jeweler. 97% if you're a farm laborer. 99% if you're an insurance underwriter. You just type a few things in the computer. You won't need anybody to spit you out your John Hancock policy. All of those jobs, gone. And this is real because this, as, as these jobs change and the safety nets that we as a society once believed would always exist, they are beginning to fall by the wayside you will continually see the fraying of the social safety nets. The federal budget will continue to be cut because funding levels will continue to decline. You will see the fissuring of work. So you look at workplaces like Uber that have shifted the cost to workers and dissolved the social contracts. And so you gotta bring your own car. You have to insure yourself. You have to do everything yourself but you will gain by being an entrepreneur in ways that we never thought. There, there, there are less pensioning jobs out there, folks. Believe it or not, there are many more organizations that are trying to get their employees to contribute to their insurance and their health coverage. Some are not even offering it anymore. It is a big change. And, and even if you just think about the wealth disparity in this country, 1% hold 40% of all private wealth in the United States, more than the bottom 90%. And the bottom 90% hold 73% of all the debt. Let me say that again. The bottom 90% hold 73% of the debt. The world is changing. Changing for folks like Yahidis who's on your campus. Some of us still think that we have processes at our colleges that make it easy for them to go to school. You know, they do the application. So nice and easy, right? You just submit your application, your little transcripts, your little residency form, and your immunization record. You send that in, and you're good to go, right? And then we're going to have them do the little financial aid. So they do the little FAFSA, and they turn in the little documents. And, and then if you have to do your selective survey, you do that. So easy, right? Boom, boom, boom. Nice and easy. And then, and then you get to take your little placement test, except in Florida, you get to take your little placement <laughs> test. <laughs> you know? So you schedule your little visit, and you take your little test, and we put you in a little category, even though the category probably doesn't make sense because you did well in high school, but that you messed up the test, and we're going to put you in a class that you shouldn't be taking. But that, I, I digress. And then we give you an advising situation. So now we're going to tell you what classes to take, even though we're going to spend 15 minutes to choose the next four or five years of your life in 15 minutes. So we'll do that real good. And then we're going to slot you into, and we don't really care too much about your life, the way you live it, but how we think your life should be lived. So we're going to make you a little schedule, and then you're going to have, have a nice little orientation program. And that's nice. And then you'll be in the first day of school. Bow! Isn't that nice and easy? Say this with me, nice and easy. It's nice and easy, right? And, and that's how students at all of our campuses, for the most part, experience their onboarding process, right? Or do they experience it this way? <laughs> I go here, I go there, I go everywhere. 
you know, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't do that. I mean, I know this doesn't happen like, like that, Dr. Williams said, it doesn't happen on your campus. Uh, you come up, your family comes up, the student comes up, I need to go there. No, no, I don't do that. You got to go to this building. They didn't tell you to go to that. I don't know why. They didn't tell you because we don't do that. That doesn't happen to any of the students at our colleges. And so you think about this for a moment. Newer students oftentimes are coming into this kind of experience where you are the experts of the experience, not them. And then, in fact, so many of them come with other challenges. 36% first time in their family to go to college. 74% employed at least part time. 33% have tremendous family duties, and 72% are low income. So many of our entering students have these much more risky profiles. And if you're an at-risk student, quote unquote at-risk, because in my experience, most people that go anywhere that's brand new is at-risk or something. Um, but so they have a difficult class, and ultimately now the student who is new to this experience decides they're not smart enough. Well, I don't belong here. And then if they don't have no money, then they say, well, I just work more hours on my job because so many of them are working. And so if I got to work, that means I can't study. If I can't study, that means I fail. And then some of them get overwhelmed. Any change in their life circumstance, think about it. I have a babysitter in place. That babysitter is no longer in place. Now my world is turned upside down. And so my family needs me, so I can't devote my time to the educational enterprise. So, so how can you have outcomes that are clear when your life becomes unclear? This is a reality of the students that you face on your campus. And then we have some that are even more savvy in terms of the educational experience. Uh, the Education Design Lab talks about the learner revolution and really is setting forth what learners expect as well. They want to know that their credit is going to be able to go somewhere if they change where they are. They want to know that they're going to get the skills that will ultimately enable them to pay their bills because as I showed you earlier, the employers have different expectations now. And it's not just enough that you have a degree. We need to know what you can do with what you got. And so that's why the competencies and, and getting credit for things that I know have more of a weight than it has had in the past. That I need that personal attention if I'm going to be successful. That, that I, I want to work with peers because it is in that engagement that I'll be able to demonstrate my ability to have teamwork. That I need real world experiences and that, and that I have to have the specific skills necessary and I need feedback because the reason why I'm on Snapchat, Facebook and all this other stuff is because I like feedback. And so we get mad at them, but guess what? They have had that little iPad, many of the students that's coming into your campus have had their little iPad since they were two or three. Some of you that have children and grandchildren, and you know how you try to quiet them down sometimes. Now, now I'm not picking on y'all, or your parenting. <laughs> you give them that little pad, one yo's, and all that they know how to get everywhere on that little pad. They can do everything. And yet in the classroom, we say you can't use your cell phone, your tablet, your iPad, but we've been giving them to them since they were little kids. So it's not their fault that we have created in them expectations that we in our higher education system are not meeting ourselves. So something's going to change. Either it's going to be us, it's going to be them, or we're going to be outside of the mainstream of the future. And that takes me to... Chinese food. <laughs> Chinese food. Now, I know we just had a little breakfast, and thank y'all for the breakfast sponsors. But I want to talk about Chinese food, not just because I like it, <laughs> but because it's an example of how industries can change not only a sector, but a whole set of sectors based on what we call disruptive innovation. I'm going to show you a disruptive innovation. You ready? This disruptive innovation happened in 1922. 
the grand opening of Kinchu Cafe. Now, in Kinchu Cafe, this was in Los Angeles, and it was a Chinese restaurant. Now, what I love about it, I don't know if you can see it, but Chinese and American dishes every day, 75 cents. And businessmen's lunch, at that time, you know, the ladies couldn't be a part of it. It was a businessman's lunch, 45 cents. Now, the prices are amazing, and I'm sure they had great food, but that's not why they're important. Why they're important is this, that they had a special delivery service from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m., and you could give them a call, and they would actually bring the food to you. This is a disruptive innovation because they could have simply tried to compete with the other Chinese restaurants. And the Chinese restaurant model was that we cook in a building, you come to the building, you sit down and eat, and you, we take your money. That's, that was the actual way it worked. But they changed the game because they said, we don't just have to sit and wait and be led by those who have the ability to get to us. We can actually make as much money going to people where they are as we could make with people coming to us. In fact, we could make more because ultimately by giving you a telephone number and actually bringing the food to you, we could take as many orders and we could take more orders outside than inside. They created Delivery. Can you imagine how many, how many restaurants, fast food right now, do delivery? That started in 1922 with them. That was a disruptive innovation. And we're talking about all what we're trying to do at our colleges. But what this work has to be is disruptive. Harvard Business Review did a wonderful explanation of disruptive innovation. I want you to take a look at it. How does a small, young company beat an industry giant on its own turf? Through what Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen calls disruptive innovation. It works like this. Big players focus on sustaining innovation, upgrading existing products and services to attract higher paying customers. But soon, they start to ignore all the regular customers who just want simple, low-cost alternatives. That's where the entrepreneurial company jumps in with that basic offering. The big guys stay focused on more profitable customers and begin to overserve, adding bells and whistles no one wants to pay for. Meanwhile, the disruptor improves its product to appeal to more people. By the time the incumbent notices, the disruptor has already started to take over the market. The classic example is the steel mini mills, which first produced low quality rebar, then moved to sheet steel, stealing business from the large mills that had been dominant. More recent disruptors include car makers like Toyota and Hyundai, which launched with economy models, then added luxury features and brands. The only way for industry giants to fight back is by launching their own disruptive innovations. To succeed, they must treat the project as a separate unit with a different business model and growth expectations. Ask what job do customers need to get done? Segment customers by job, not by product, market size, or demographics. And develop basic low-cost ways to get the job done. That's how Procter & Gamble came up with Crest White Strips, a cheap do-it-yourself alternative to an expensive dental service. Disruptive innovation creates new markets and reshapes existing ones. To achieve growth in a fast-changing world, you want to be a disruptor. Don't be disrupted. I want to show you another disruptor. You all see the theme when you, when, when, as I go through these next couple of slides. So, this is now 1948, and... In-N-Out Burger has this great innovation. We're going to make a drive through Now, most fast food restaurants you look at today, they have what? You, this is audience participation. They have what? 
Thank you. <laughs> so a drive through Because they recognized we needed to find a way to make ourselves distinctive, but also to serve a purpose. We could increase the sales of our food by creating a lane and moving them through. Diners Club. Anybody ever heard of that? That's the first credit card, y'all. This idea that we could help the business community come to lunch and not need cash. So we would create a credit-based system that now, this is 1955, but the actual credit card was started in 1950. This idea that we could actually change the way we exchange basic dealings with one another on a credit basis, disruptive innovation. <laughs> you ever heard of this place? 1955, this is the franchise model. This idea that if we have consistency of quality and that we work in a systematic way, we could actually increase the number of folks that got served. We could create a business model that could be replicated internationally. And the franchise movement in America at this scale was perfected by McDonald's. They didn't sell just burgers, even though when, if you go anywhere in the world, you can get two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pick it all, you know, sesame seed bun. <laughs> but they perfected a model because they wanted to produce a quality product that had consistency that they could build a brand that people could work with. And of course, in 1973, we had the cash register, the electronic cash register, so you could ring up things fast and you could continue to move the process. All of these disruptive innovations, my favorite came out in 1994. <laughs> Online ordering. You could actually, 1994 was the first uh, opportunity to use this kind of online ordering for food. Pizza Hut, making it great. Disruption that changes, that causes revolutionary advances, that moves a whole community forward, a whole industry forward, a whole world forward. We have to really be thinking about what will be the community college's disruptive innovation. What will it be that we will be able to stand and say, we made the tremendous change? Think about the drive-in. Anybody ever seen a drive-in? Well, many of us, many of us, yes, I like that. Many of us may be too young to remember <laughs> these drive-in movie theaters. You know, but the idea of being outside and, and having the little thing on your car, so that the speaker on your car, so you could, and then they said, well, you know, there are times when it rains, so we'll actually create a box theater, right? Wonderful concept, nice air condition. They recognized that you could not necessarily make money uh, from just showing the movie, so they decided that the way you make money is through concessions, right? And then they said, well, we'll take it home. Why, why, why are we worrying about the concession piece? Let's, let's just set up a system where you could actually take the videos home. You could watch the videos home. Another disruptive innovator came and said, yeah, but why do I have to go back and forth to this store? I can just use my own home system. Think about this. Anybody know what that is? You know, I'll just take my videos of all my family, and, and then we put them in something like that. Wow. Remember that? And then, and then you basically use one of these. How about that? Anybody know what that is? <laughs> this is, this is the, uh, this is the um, Smithsonian part of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Commodore 64. Woo, state of the ark. <laughs> and think about how those things that you just sure saw was such an innovative practice at the time. It cost so much money because it cost forever to pay off to get some of these things that you now use that for. Everything you just saw is on your hip. 
your video, your music, your pictures, all of it now. Innovation, it requires change. I'm going to ask everybody to stand right now. Find one other person right now. Now, I want you to take, now I don't want us to be inappropriate, but I want you to take a moment and just look at that person up and down. Just look at them, observe them, just look at them, just look at them. Say hello first and just look at them. <laughs> just look at them. Look at, look at them, don't look at me, look at them. All righty. All right. This is, this is not love connection. Here we go. Now, I want you to face them back to back. You don't have to touch backs, but just face back to back. Go. Okay. Change two things. Change two things about yourself right now. Change two things right now. All right, turn to the person and see if they recognize what you changed. Don't change back, don't change, don't change back. All right, all right, all right. Now look at me, now look at me. How many of you spotted both changes on your person? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. How many spotted one change? Raise your hand. Okay. How many spotted no changes? Raise your hand. Okay. All right, turn to that neighbor again. Turn to that person again. All right, look at them. Okay, turn back around. Change two more things. Now, this is a PG program. <laughs> All right, turn around. Let's see if we can find it out. Seem like some of y'all are having a little fun with this change in business. <laughs> All right, come back in the pool. Come on back, come on back, come on back. Come on back. How many of you were able to spot the two new changes? Raise your hand. Okay, less than half. How many were able to spot one of them? How many weren't able to spot the two changes? Okay, yeah, all right, all right. Turn back around. Just kidding. <laughs> Change back. <laughs> Change back. Change back. Now you can look like you looked when you came in, in, in the original. <laughs> now.
Now, I want to ask a couple of questions. First, in the first time you changed, the first time you changed, right? How many of you made changes that were hard for the, you made them with the intention of making it difficult for the person to actually recognize the change? Raise your hand. All right, all of you stand up that, that made it intentionally hard. Come on, stand up. All right, so you made it difficult. Why did you make it difficult? Why did you make it difficult? You want to win. Okay, yeah, listen, that's a good, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. William Watson, good answer. Why did you, why did you? You wanted to work for it, okay, all right, in the back. All right, you're testing their skills of perception. Yes, here. You want to win, all right. Oh, you like to beat your boss, very good. If they have attention to detail, yes. You didn't want them to get it, okay. Was that the instruction? Let's give them a hand. You may be seated. Now, thank you for that. Those of you that on the second time worked hard to make it not as obvious for the person to see you stand, the second round, the second time, if you made it difficult the second time for the person to recognize the two things you changed, please stand up. The second time. All right. Come on now. More of y'all was like, mm, you ain't going to find out this time. <laughs> All right. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? <laughs> okay. Competition, yes. Let's give them a hand. That's exactly what happens to our students. They come into an experience. I didn't tell you why you were doing what you were doing. I just asked you to do it. So I didn't tell you if there were any rules. You made your own rules up. You decided whether it was going to be easy. You decided whether it was going to be hard. You decided what you were going to change, what you weren't going to change. You decided how you were going to negotiate a relationship with someone that you never met before. Some of y'all may might know each other and still decided to negotiate the relationship the way you wanted it to. But either way, you came into an experience, and I asked you to do something, and I gave you a time limit to do it, and I didn't give you as much direction because you didn't know what my purpose of it was, and that's how students experience the college. We give them instruction. We don't always give them why we're asking you to do what you're doing. And then if they, for some areas, not all, we could make the process a little easier, but we make it a little harder because we want to see if you have the perception skills, if you're going to make it, if you're going to, well, I don't have time to really get into the details. That's how many of our students experience our colleges because when they walk in the door, we expect them to change. We expect them to do what we say do without telling them why they're doing it, but just do it. And without enough information on how you do the things that you do, you expect them to figure it out. And figure it out because we have it figured out. And you've got to get with our program. That might be heaven calling. Is somebody? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and maybe it's that delivery order from 1922. <laughs> pizza, it could be Pizza Hut. But it's critical for us to understand that the exact same experience that you had in a fun way, our students experience and is no fun. And so we, when we think about how we are creating the conditions for students to succeed and in the concept of a time where the world is changing and everything is happening fast, and even though we do have some success stories that we can point to as why you should come here, there's still enough folks that come into our experience thinking, is this really for me? Because you know the language that they don't know. Anybody who's not from New York City, if I dropped you off at the subway station at 42nd Street and said, good luck, 
you really would need good luck. So we have to understand that we are in a time of disruptive innovation. We're in a time where, where employers are looking for things from us that are different. We're in a time where if we don't do it better, we'll be out. Taxi cab said we're going to not pick you up if we don't like you. Uber says, give me your credit card, come on through. Now taxi cab drivers say, well, why don't you go on my taxi app? So things are changing and disruption is happening and all these things are going on as my computer's messing up. <laughs> but it's back. Because we have to recognize that the community college space needs a new business model that says that the key to recruitment and retention is offering affordable programs and not cheap courses. That we have to ensure that programs lead to the goals that students have and that we have to recruit students into programs that actually lead them to opportunities that will help them to sustain their families with a life-sustaining, family-sustaining wage. That we have to monitor them and support them not only when they get here but even in the process of recruiting them to come to us. That we have to ensure that all they experience actually gives them the skills that they need to be successful so that we can help to build the regional talent ecosystem in fields of regional economic importance because they need to see the connection between what they start and the hope of what they're going to finish. And so you've heard Dr. Williams and you'll hear uh, Dr. Wyoli will talk about becoming a student-ready college. Uh, this idea that we have to strategically and holistically advance student success and work tirelessly to educate all students for civic and economic participation in a global and interconnected society that we got to get them on a path which starts at the connection through strategic recruitment, through saying that if you come here and you follow these rules and these opportunities, if you gain these experiences, you'll not only be successful in filling out the application, but you'll be successful in that first year. You'll get through all of the prerequisites that you need to move forward. You'll be able to deal with those courses that have caused others trouble because we're figuring out how to do that right. And we'll make sure that you'll progress when you get in your program. And you'll have the kind of applied learning experiences that give you the skills that enable you to be successful when you transition. Because we want you to complete not just a credential, but we want you to complete an experience that will leverage you to be everything that you were meant to be and more. And so as a college, we've got to make sure that we have clear roadmaps to the student's goal, that we design our intake process as an on-ramp, and that we continue to create a value proposition at each of these junctures, that we track their progress, that we make sure that they are, are learning outcomes, and that the assessments are aligned with programs because when we do this, they will stop dropping out. When we do this, they won't transfer early. When we do this, we'll see higher completion rates where folks not taking all those credits that they actually don't need, that they'll finish their degrees sooner and of course build the skills that will make them employable. Because at the end of the day, that's what they want for themselves. They want to be able to know that they can actually achieve economic opportunities to successfully help themselves and their families. And so what can we do? What can you do? What must you do? Of course, you got to ask students why they're in college. You have to help them navigate their way through the different offices, programs, and services at your college. You've got to connect them with services or resources that can help them with career exploration, goal selection, and ongoing academic assistance. You've got to have high expectations for them and hold them accountable. The students, as many of us, as all of us know, don't rise to low expectations. That we have to ask them for feedback about their experience and what works and what needs improvement and what's missing. We have to have the courage to ask them, are we serving them well? And that's why the work of SESI is so important because they engage in that work. We have to encourage participation in out-of-class activities. We have to help them build the peer support networks. We have to show students how proud we are to work at our colleges and that they should be proud to be enrolled at the college 
as well. Now, many of you, I've been here to St. Pete before. Many of you have been other places. I want you to know, here's where I tell you this golden rule. Push the person next to you. Die hard. Push him just a little bit. He's about to tell you the golden rule. It's the golden rule. Golden rule. You ready for the golden rule? Don't cosign. Say that with me. Don't cosign. Don't cosign. Now, what is cosigning? I'll give you an example, my favorite example. Here we go. Student comes to financial aid, gets whatever assistance. Student goes to a faculty member or another staff member and says, you know, I hate financial aid. They get on my nerves. They're always losing my paperwork. That staff or faculty member says, you know what? You're the third student today that came in here and said that you lose, they lose. If I can't, I don't understand what's going on with them. You've now co-signed. You've taken the student at face value. You don't know the details of financial aid and how many letters they already sent them telling them to bring the same stuff. But you've now co-signed. And so the student now feels like, oh, well, if you don't like it, why should I like it? And so we have to be very careful as educators. When we come and, and the student says to you, you know, I can't stand Professor Johnson. Professor Johnson, the hardest professor in this school, I can't stand her. You can't say, well, you know what, I can't stand either. She also got an attitude. <laughs> because when you do that, you allow the students to feel like this is a hard, you don't even like to work there, so why should they stay there? You have to be a cheerleader for your campus. If something's wrong, you can't hide it. You have to say, well, that hasn't been my experience. So I've heard, never heard a student say it that way. But you know what? I'll take you to Professor Johnson, and maybe we can talk about it together. But that you find a way to reinforce that this is a community that cares about excellence. This is a community that cares about the student. And this is, this is a, an institution that cares about getting it right. We need more get it right schools. That when we have something going on in our school, our goal is to get it right. It's not to get it over with, it's to get it right. If someone is in our midst and they're asking us things we don't know, our job is to get them to the person that can get them the answers so that we can get it right. Because when we don't get it right, they internalize it. And we help to create those students who stop and drop out. And so we have to develop a get it right mentality. So I need you to say that. Get it right. Get it right. All right. All right. We also have to recognize the value of students' talents, abilities, skills, and experiences and connect them with opportunities to contribute. Students want to participate. Yahidis would never be going to Columbia, I believe if she didn't get involved in the RCC TV program, if somebody didn't tell her about the honors program, if somebody along the way did not encourage her to go beyond her expectations. And so it is our responsibility to help them to connect to those opportunities. And of course, we have to communicate and demonstrate to students that we care about their success. Those are the things we have to do. So I'll boil it down into three things. First, you want to know the student's GPA. Not their grade point average. But these are the three questions every person on your campus should ask every student, whether you are in the cafeteria, whether you are the security guard, whether you are in the classroom, whether you are in the court, wherever you are on your campus, there are three questions that you should be asking the students. Question number one, their goals. Second, their plan. Third, their actions. What are your goals? What are your plans? What actions are you taking? Because when we do that, we establish for that student the ability and the platform to express themselves and to show you how clear they are on the things that they want to do, to make a connection for them if they need the connection, but most importantly, to yourself, connect with that student on a deeper level in a way that you can participate that makes sense. Goals, plans, and actions are the birth of hope. Students will never have hope if they don't have goals and plans and actions. 
Students will have dreams, but they won't have hopes. You see, we need to help them to understand that that GPA will take them every place they need to go in life. Because at the end of the day, our ability to move them, to motivate them, to encourage them, to inspire them, to lift them up, in many instances rests with your ability to embrace them, to question them, to love them. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about the fact that they're in your presence. It's, in, it's the fact that they're going to change the world. And you might be that disruptive innovation. They may have lived lives where everything has gone wrong, where people have turned against them, and so they're on a path that actually is dark, and you are the disruptive innovator that comes in their midst and says, did you think about how you could turn lemons into lemonade? Did you think about how you can take your talent, your ability, your energy, your excitement, everything that you've got to become everything you were meant to be? Did you think? Because I thought about it when I saw you walk in this place. Every time somebody sees you on campus, they should see the future breaking out in front of them because you had the future that was broken out in front of you. Every day, you and I must help to move a needle a needle of change, a needle of progress, a needle of hope, so that we can get to this day. At the end of the day, each of us are striving for our students to get here. There's a Yahidis on your campus waiting for you to get them here. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have questions, right? Sure, we've got ten, about 10 minutes. Dr. Bastian, thank you so much. I cannot think of a better way to kick off this conference. You inspired us, you challenged us to meet the students where they are, to change, to be that disruptive innovator. So we just appreciate it. We've got about five to, to seven minutes. We can take a couple of questions if uh, anybody from the audience has got a question for Dr. Bastian. And all ask questions at one time. <laughs> but as you can see, I'm a little passionate about this work. There they go. They got mics. Here we go. It's very important that you ground every conversation in how is this decision or this conversation going to impact the student's success. Everything has to be grounded in student success. But your campus has to define what student success is. And that campus definition will be different based on the ethos of the campus. Many years ago, when I went to Skyline Community College, I visited Skyline Community College, and when you walk into the campus, there is this ethos of social justice for them, preparing the student to be a, 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 a real uh, champion of social justice. Is in, you walk in the walls, you see the pictures, you experience this ethic of social justice. Well, so every conversation on the campus has to center around what moves that campus forward. And when the conversations don't, you're the one that has to take the values of the institution and bring them to the table. Now, everybody is not going to always know the mission statement of the College of the Values, but those who really want to see student success as the leading indicator of success need to whip out those values. So when people have something to say that we know is a roadblock or a hindrance, then that's when you say, well, you know, I looked at the value statement. And one of our values is responsibility. And it's not just about the student's responsibility, but the institution's responsibility. You think that decision lines up with that particular value? Now, that means sometimes that you're going to be the lone wolf. That means sometimes it's going to be lonely fighting for those ideas and principles. And the question becomes, are you the one that does it alone? Do you have a coalition of the willing 
Do you connect with influencers? So from my point of view, every one of you should be an influential person on your campus. You should be a person of influence on your campus. Doesn't matter what your title is. You should be a person of influence on your campus. You should be able to activate the network of those on your campus that believe the things that you believe so that you're not always the only one standing by yourself. But go to those values. Take out that mission state. Every one of you will go through some accreditation cycle. Not to be funny, but I would use accreditation as a wonderful opportunity to explain and show folks that, well, you know, I'm in standard nine of the HLA or standard nine of Middle State says, so I mean, I just hope that we're complying with it because I know they're going to ask. <laughs> so, yes. Sure. Part of what you have to do, in my opinion, is to embed within your structures opportunities to engage them so that they have the experience of the campus. And that means that you'll have to work with your local foundation boards to try to raise some money to get some on-campus employment opportunities for students that may not be covered by your federal work study students so that your students can choose to work on campus instead of off campus and that they can actually then have the benefits of being in an environment where they can learn and grow. So there are those kinds of strategies that you have to look for. You know, how do, how do we engage in the AmeriCorps program so that some of our students can be in those kinds of programs and work with the students that will help them build the momentum and capacity. The more that you can get students engaged in peer relationships, where you have a student that is uh, uh, performing at high levels, working with students that are aspirational, the more you benefit both groups. And so, but you, that sometimes costs money, and you have to engage strategies to raise that money to do that work. Yes? Okay, uh, great speech. Uh, really you. appreciate everything. Earlier you mentioned that uh, uh, you accept students uh, with whatever preparation that they come with, yes. and I, um, I am a proponent of that. And you also mentioned about um, strategic recruitment yes. so that students can be more successful. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you, in your opinion, and coming from a faculty standpoint, how would you address teaching students that don't necessarily want to be taught in the classroom? When you say don't necessarily want to be taught, I, unpack that for me. I don't know what you mean. Uh, maybe grandma or, or somebody told them to go to college. So they're at college. They have the headphones in. They are not participating in the class. Mm -hmm. They are actually disrupting class. Mm -hmm. You want to, as a faculty member, you want to reach everybody. You want to be that change agent for that person. Mm -hmm. But they have this wall up, and they just don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Can't put them out, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. Just in your personal opinion, how would you? Part of it is understanding why the wall exists and creating a space for the wall to be uncovered. And so you do that in classroom assignments. Like for example, I used to teach paralegal studies courses. So my first class, everybody has to go in the hallway. That's odd, right? And you have to line up according to your birth, date of birth, and decade in which you were born. But you can't talk. So that's a little weird, right? Like so first of all, we're in the hallway. Everybody can see us. We don't even know each other because it's the first day of class, and you're asking us to communicate without being able to communicate. I built a culture on the first day of class of engagement so that that person that would potentially be disengaged because they haven't been brought into a community where they've been forced to actually engage, that creates a cultural phenomenon on that first day of class of engagement. So I, I'm able to use that as a strategy to minimize the disengagement of folks in that kind of scenario. So you'll be surprised. You know, some of my students that are a little bit more savvy, they'll whip out their ID cards, and then the, you can find it, and somebody will emerge as a leader to organize, or maybe they will actually type it on a cell phone or whatever. But what you want to do as soon as you can in the beginning of a semester is to create an environment in your classroom where disengagement is so difficult that, that, that actually disengagement can be weeded out as early as possible versus having them there two, three weeks and now they're like, I'm not, I don't care what you say. I don't even want to be here. If you get them engaged in, as a cultural aspect of your class in that first class, when you create class norms and you engage the community in the class norms conversation, it does make a difference, I have found in my own teaching.
out of time. Thank you, Dr. Bastian. Thank you yeah. so much. Me too. Thank you. I, I failed to mention earlier that all of the presentations will be loaded on our Moving the Needle website. Um, probably give us next week before that occurs, but I uh, just wanted you to know that. We now have a 30-minute break. Our next concurrent session begins at 11. I would encourage you to take advantage of this time to uh, meet with our sponsors. They're out in the lobby. Uh, refreshments are actually in the four classrooms behind these walls. So if you go out to the right or left end of the classrooms, you'll find the refreshments there. Thank you very much, and have a good conference. <laughs>